I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. Shall we play a game? Here we go. Better alive, you are coming with me. Do or do not. There is no try. I can handle myself. Yeah, I noticed. The sleeper has awakened! Could it carry my wisdom beyond the barrier? Excuse me, I'd just like to ask a question. What does God need with a starship? We have a dangerous situation out on Nimbus 3. From all we can make out, a terrorist force has captured the only settlement. And they've taken hostages. <laughs> Get those hostages back safely. Now the Klingons respond. No, but you can bet they will. I deeply regret this desperate act, but these are desperate times. I have no desire to harm these innocents, but do not put me to the test. You look like you've just seen a ghost. Perhaps I have, Captain. It's Cybok. After all these years, you finally caught up with me. I ordered you to defend your ship. You ordered me to kill my brother. You must surrender. Shoot him! Cyborg also is a son of Sarek. You made that up. I did not. A hostile force has taken control of our vessel. Understood, Enterprise. We are dispatching a rescue ship immediately. It's time I announced my intentions to the rest of the ship. Our destination is the planet Shakari, which lies at the center of the galaxy. Every culture in existence shares this common dream of a place from which creation sprang. For us, that place will soon be reality. The only reality I see is that I'm a prisoner on my own ship. What are you standing around for? Do you not know a jailbreak when you see one? You can't expect us to stand by while you take the ship into the Great Battle. I dreamt that a madman had taken over the Enterprise. Scotty, dear, he's not a madman. Cyborg has simply put us in touch with feelings that we've always been afraid to express. This kind man took away my pain. Damn it, Bones, you're a doctor. You know that pain and guilt can't be taken away with a wave of a magic wand. I don't want my pain taken away. I need my pain. Warp speed now. We have traveled far! Star Trek V The Final Frontier warp speeded its way onto the big screen on the 9th of June 1989 in the USA and hit the UK on the 20th of October. Directed by Captain Kirk himself, this would be William Shatner's first feature film behind the camera, following the path of his co-star Leonard Nimoy, who handled directing duties on Star Trek 3 and 4. This film had a budget of nearly $30 million and didn't perform as well as its predecessor, raking in $52 million worldwide but thankfully it did perform well when it hit home video and Laserdisc. The film was met with mostly negative reviews from the critics, with most highlighting its weak script and rubbish special effects. According to the film's producer, the film nearly killed the franchise. The New York Times considered the film to be disappointing to fans and non-fans alike. The Washington Post called it a shambles, and it made Siskel and Ebert's list of the worst movies of 1989, along with another big blockbuster, Ghostbusters 2. It wasn't all doom and gloom for Star Trek V, it did get some favourable reviews with some critics highlighting its well-executed humour, the performances, especially Lawrence Luckenbill as Cybok, and the cinematography by Andrew Laszlo. The film came out at a challenging time, facing stiff competition despite a strong push with marketing and licensed products such as action figures. 1989 was the year of sequels, and the summer season was packed with big hitters such as Lethal Weapon 2, Elm Street 5, Back to the Future Part 2, Ghostbusters 2, Karate Kid 3, The Last Crusade, License to Kill, and the most anticipated film of that year, Batman. 
Star Trek V ended up having its shortest run out of the long-running series at the cinema, as cinema owners were making space for the following week's big movie. Star Trek V over the years has become a guilty pleasure for some, and others still feel it's a massive letdown. With all films that have troubled productions, it's often how they were made people find more interesting than the final product. So in the case of Star Trek V, it's become an interesting what if. What if Shatner got to make the film he originally envisioned and had FX House ILM at his disposal, it could have been the most ambitious entry in the franchise. Leonard Nimoy had directed Star Trek 3 and 4, with the latter proving to be the most successful at the box office and was critically well received. William Shatner had agreed to return for part 4, but had a deal put in place that he would direct part 5. With The Voyage Home being a hit, Paramount Pictures were very keen to crack on with a follow-up. Shatner conceived his idea for the film's story by watching televangelists. They were dominating TV during the 80s. Bill felt they were repulsive, strangely horrifying, and yet he became absolutely fascinated with them. Shatner was intrigued that not only did these personalities convince others God was speaking directly to them, but they became wealthy by what Shatner considered false messages. The televangelists formed the basis for the character Tsar that was later renamed to Cybok. In Shatner's early draft, Kirk is overwhelmed by Cybok's superior numbers of followers, and Spock, McCoy and the rest of the Enterprise crew come to believe in Cybok's divinity. Kirk pretends to believe in Cybok's message in efforts to travel with him to the God planet. When Kirk confronts God, the image of the being transforms into that of Satan. Shatner presented his ideas to Paramount and they liked what Shatner came up with and they agreed to hire a writer to draft a film treatment. Producer Harve Bennett was exhausted by his work on the previous three Star Trek films and wanted to move on, feeling that he was not part of the Star Trek family after having a difficult experience on the voyage home. But Shatner managed to convince him, but Bennett disagreed with several elements of Shatner's story, feeling that because no one could assuredly answer the question of God's existence, the ending of the film would never be satisfying. The studio agreed with Bennett, reasoning that the subject matter could be too weighty or offensive to theatre goers. Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry objected to the character's search for God in general, and more so the idea of a God portrayed by Western religion. Roddenberry, Nimoy and Kelly all disagreed that Spock and McCoy would betray Kirk in their efforts to follow Cybok. Shatner and Bennett began rewriting the story. Bennett suggested going for a safer option of turning the god entity into an evil alien, pretending to be god for his own gain. They approached Star Trek II writer and director Nicholas Meyer to pen the script, but he was unavailable. Bennett luckily stumbled across a script by David Larry and showed his work to Shatner. They agreed that he would be a good fit for the task of scripting Star Trek V, and David was excited to be involved. In 1988, the Writers Guild of America went on strike, causing David to stop working on the script, causing delays to the production. When the strike came to an end and David returned, Bill Shatner wasn't happy with David's revisions, which he felt transformed the search for God into the search for the mythical paradise Shakari, a place of ultimate knowledge of which Cyborg had received visions. The script was also rewritten to address Nimoy and Kelly's concerns about their character motivations. Finally, everyone had given their approval to the revised script, which had been heavily streamlined from Shatner's original concept for the film. Paramount budgeted the production at the same cost of the voyage home, but part four dealt with less visual effects, and the majority of the film was set on Earth. Paramount was concerned that the film would go over budget, as the script had a lot of big ideas, so they ordered cuts to be made. For the new cast of characters, we have Lawrence Luckenbill as Cybok, Spock's half-brother who was cast out of their society at a young age for rejecting logic and following his emotions. Sean Connery was originally contacted to star in the role, but was busy with Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Shatner discovered Luckenbill by chance. Channel surfing late one night, he saw him on PBS performing as Lyndon B. Johnson. When Shatner called him to offer him the role, Lawrence accepted immediately without even reading the script. Lawrence has starred in other movies and TV shows over the years, but has focused most of his career on stage. David Warner plays as a Federation representative who gets captured by Cybok's followers on Nimbus 3. David didn't audition, but agreed to the role after Shatner swore that his character would survive to the end. David is of course best known for his performances in The Omen, Time After Time, Time Bandits, Tron and Titanic, often being cast as the villain. David Warner did come back for Star Trek VI, but didn't play the same character, but instead a Klingon. 
Cynthia Gow plays as a Romulan ambassador on Nimbus 3. She only had a small number of roles on TV before retiring from acting in 1992. The late Charles Cooper plays as the Klingon diplomat on Nimbus. Shatner had intended George Murdoch to play the Klingon, but changed his mind on seeing Cooper's performance. Charles was a veteran TV actor who did appear again as a Klingon in Star Trek The Next Generation. Todd Bryant stars as Klingon Captain Kla, who is out for personal glory in his efforts to kill Captain Kirk. Todd was spotted by the casting director while at a beach party and they offered him the role. Todd performed his audition twice, as Shatner requested that he repeat his performance speaking in Klingon. Todd started out as an actor, but also trained as a stunt performer, so he gets regular gigs acting and providing stunts on some of the biggest productions. Spice Williams Crosby plays as Vixis, Clark's lieutenant. Spice was another stunt performer and actor. She originally thought she would be playing Kirk's love interest, but didn't realise she was auditioning to play as a villain, and thankfully really enjoyed playing the part. The late George Murdoch, another veteran of American television, who as mentioned earlier was recast as the God Entity. George would also make an appearance in the Next Generation show, playing another character. And last but not least, we have producer Harve Bennett, making a cameo as a Starfleet Admiral, who gives Kirk his orders to save the diplomats on Nimbus 3. Principal photography began in October of 1988 in and around Los Angeles, California. The production faced difficulties straight away with the Hollywood Union truck drivers going on strike over pay cuts and overtime charges. So the production had to seek out non-union drivers, fully aware that the Teamsters might retaliate and possibly damage equipment. The shoot in Yosemite proved trying for Shatner as two days were wasted when they saw the dailies and noticed a tree was in shock giving away the illusion that Captain Kirk was up a great height. The crew said Shatner was speeding through his lines in efforts to get through the tight schedule. They felt he needed to slow it down to help his performance, which he duly noted. Nimoy didn't want to interfere with Shatner's directing duties, as Bill didn't look over his shoulder questioning his work on Star Trek 3 and 4, but Nimoy did reach out to Shatner when he felt he could help when managing the crew. The shoot in the desert for the planet Nimbus 3 was difficult for the crew due to the heat, causing Shatner to lose his temper when people were failing to follow his instructions. The stress of shooting on location managed to calm down once they started shooting on the sound stages at Paramount for the scenes on the Enterprise, Bird of Prey sets, the Paradise City interiors and the campfire location. The production crew fabricated a stand-in set for the God Planet location where additional scenes were filmed to combine with the location footage. The cast celebrated the end of filming in the last week of December 1988 and gave a press conference on the set of the Enterprise Bridge. Shatner ran a rough cut to the Paramount executives. It was long, had no music or visual effects, but they were impressed and very happy with what Shatner had shot. He felt relieved that he had done a good job, but what he wasn't prepared for was the quality of the visual effects and salvaging an ending that didn't work. Paramount wanted the film to run shorter as the rough cut was over two hours. They wanted to squeeze in more showings at the cinema. Their target runtime was one hour and 45 minutes. During the process of editing, the studio held screen tests. The film didn't go down well, as only a small portion considered the film excellent, a rating that most other Star Trek films had enjoyed. Segments of the film were re-edited for the theatrical release to improve the film's pacing, and additional scenes were included on the Bird of Prey to make the circumstances of Kirk's rescue clearer. The second screening, with the final effects and sound in place, thankfully received more favourable reviews. The film opens on the planet Nimbus 3, where a Vulcan called Cyborg has led his followers on a mission to capture diplomats at a neutral location to advance dialogue between the Federation. Cyborg's goal is to get the attention of Starfleet Command, so he can commandeer a starship for his mission. Back on Earth, the crew of the USS Enterprise are enjoying shore leave. Their leave is interrupted when they are ordered to rescue the diplomats. Their mission, however, has been intercepted by an ambitious Klingon captain, who decides to pursue Kirk for personal glory. On Nimbus 3, the crew of the Enterprise discover that renegade Vulcan Cybok is Spock's half-brother. Cybok reveals his intentions to reach the mythical planet Shakari to seek the answers on how creation began. The planet lies behind a seemingly impenetrable barrier near the centre of the galaxy. Kirk, Spock and Bones are put in the hold, while Cybok uses his unique abilities to bring the crew onto his side as he gains control of the Enterprise. Scotty manages to break Kirk, Spock and Bones free. They manage to send out a message of help, but it's intercepted by the Klingons who pretend to be Starfleet. Cyborg doesn't mean no harm and uses his abilities to bring the trio on his side. Only Spock and Kirk prove resistant to Cyborg. Spock is unmoved by the experience and Kirk refuses the Vulcan's offer. 
telling him that his pain is necessary to what makes him who he is. Cybok reluctantly declares a truce with Kirk, realising that he needs his leadership experience to navigate the Enterprise to Shakari. The Star Trek films always had industrial light and magic at their disposal to create the visual effects, but for Star Trek V, the FX company was swamped with work, as 1989 was scheduled for many big event movies. ILM were working on Ghostbusters 2, The Last Crusade and The Abyss. The producers had to find another FX house to take on the job and work within a tight budget of around $4 million and a short time frame. The producers solicited test footage from various FX houses to judge who was the best in able to create the film's main effects, including the planet Shakari and the godlike being which resided there. Brand Ferran's FX company, Associates and Ferran were picked. Ferran's company specialised in work for commercials and TV, but had worked on feature films such as Altered States and Little Shop of Horrors. The film incorporates matte paintings, miniatures, blue screen opticals and rear projection. Brand Ferran tried to reduce the amount of blue screen work and push for as much rear projection as he could to help speed up the process to save time. The Great Barrier effect was created using chemicals which were dropped into large water tanks to create swirls and other reactions. The god column in which the false god appeared was created by a rapid rotating cylinder through which light was projected. The result appeared on film as a column of light. Ferran used a beam splitter to project actor George Murdoch's head into the cylinder, giving the appearance that the false god resided within the column. For the film's climax, William Shatner wanted the crew to battle rock monsters that breathed fire, but this idea was dropped due to the difficulties during filming. With the high cost of each costume for the rock men, they could only have one instead of ten. A test was filmed on the day, but they had mechanical problems, and the crew weren't happy with the results, and Shatner said it looked like a guy in a silly rubber suit knowing that what they had shot would probably be never used. The comic book adaptation did however make use of the Rockmen, as I'm guessing it was taken from the script directly and published not knowing they were deleted from the film. Shatner insisted on viewing lots of the test footage before he proceeded with each shot, requesting time-consuming changes, thus making it very difficult as he and the FX company were on opposite sides of the country. Ferran's company were late delivering the shots and didn't have enough time to do multiple passes on sequences so things started to look very bland and flat. Shatner wanted major changes but this would bump up the budget and Paramount refused to pay out more money and demanded they start cutting out these effect shots. Shatner and Ferran met to discuss how to replace the rock men. They both agreed to a blob of light and energy that would rise up and chase after Kirk, shape-shifting while in pursuit. Ferran spent weeks trying to achieve what Shatner wanted. Once delivered, Shatner was extremely disappointed with the low quality, so a lot of the footage was dropped and only a small amount remained in the film. Out of all the Star Trek films, number 5 certainly has the weakest visual effects out of the bunch. Switching FX houses is one of the main problems. If the new technicians have no experience shooting science fiction films on this scale and being familiar with the methods used to achieve the best results, then they will suffer, even though they have all the right equipment at their disposal. You do get the impression lots of FX shots have been dropped, and most of the time the film just has a quick shot of a starship moving left to right, looking very uninspiring to just bridge one scene to another. When you see a visual effects shot, that has some creative camera movement and looks well presented, it's actually recycled footage from a previous Star Trek film. Oddly, some shots have a strange frame rate, making it look like stop motion. To be honest, the quality of the visual effects looks similar to the BBC's Red Dwarf show. The Great Barrier effect does a passable job of pulling off something visually interesting, and I never had a problem with the floating head of the god at the end when he first appears. But in all, 90% of the visual effects shots look boring, flat and unfinished. It would be nice one day to have a director's cut of Star Trek V, with the effects improved and a story fleshed out. I know William Shatner has pushed Paramount to let him do it, but they have always denied his request, which is a shame. The legendary composer Jerry Goldsmith returns to the franchise to provide the score. Jerry kickstarted the movie series and introduced a new theme for Star Trek, taking inspiration from his good friend Alexander Courage, who created the original theme tune for the TV show. Composer James Horner took over for parts 2 and 3, and number 4 had Leonard Rosenman. Both composers brought on their own themes, but with Jerry back at the helm, he returns his classic theme that at the time had been used as the main theme tune for Star Trek The Next Generation. 
Jerry's score to Star Trek V features all his classic traits, bold action cues with percussion rhythms and forceful brass. As the movie has moments of drama and comedy, Jerry didn't want to bounce between the two and just focused on the drama and themes for the god planet which he highlighted as being the most difficult. Once they arrive on Shakari, there is a five note theme that does sound somewhat familiar to his work on Ridley Scott's Legend from 1985. Jerry uses his tried and trusted techniques of combining orchestral pieces with synthesizers and electronic themes get sprinkled throughout the score, especially with the introduction of Cybok on Nimbus 3. And the main theme has the sound of an engine starting up as the big Star Trek theme kicks in, a very cool addition. And the Klingon Bird of Prey utilizes a wailing electronic ram's horn to emulate the sound of a large bird. Also returning is the composer's Klingon theme, which was only teased in the motion picture. And in the final frontier, it's expanded and given a new lease of life. The score came to LP tape and CD in 1989, and certainly wasn't complete with extensive edits and the tracks in a random order. Thankfully, Star Trek and Jerry Goldsmith fans got the chance in 2010 to get hold of an expanded version, featuring the complete score and some alternative cues. This album is a definite must-have and is still available for $25 from Intrada.com. All the Star Trek scores are interesting and quite unique, but for me, when Jerry Goldsmith is composing, his style just fits this universe, with my favourites being this one and Star Trek Insurrection. You could add Star Trek The Motion Picture, due to its unique mix of lush melodies and experimental synth compositions, but Final Frontier and Insurrection get the most playtime due to the great mix of action cues and great rendition of the Star Trek theme. Star Trek V did receive a video game, but only on DOS for the PC, published by Mindscape. The game features a lot of detailed cutscenes, following the plot of the movie quite closely. The game starts out as a flight simulator as you make your way through the Great Barrier, shooting asteroids and stuff along the way while giving orders to the crew. Then after meeting the false god, you fight the Klingon in a punch-up, then go after the bird of prey. So some liberties were taken with the story for the final act. Reviews at the time pointed out its difficulty and lack of a save option. The game is only 20 minutes long if you know what you're doing. Presentation-wise, the graphics are quite impressive, and it's probably worth a go if you want to take a trip down memory lane. A game was developed for the NES console by Bandai that was cancelled before release. A prototype of the game was leaked in 2006, containing four stages, and is incomplete. For three of the levels, you play as Captain Kirk shooting Cybox followers on Nimbus, the Enterprise, and flying rocks on Shakari. The third level gives you control of the Enterprise, as you shoot your way through asteroids, making your way to the Great Barrier. Graphics-wise, it doesn't look too bad, and with only four stages, it's pretty short. No idea why it was cancelled, but if you are intrigued, you can emulate it on your PC or Apple Mac. I never got the chance to see Star Trek V back when it came out in the cinema, being only seven years old and my parents not really being huge fans of film in general. I had to beg and plead the following year for my dad to take me to see Ninja Turtles, making it my first trip to the cinema. I do recall the promotions for the film, however, and seeing William Shatner talking about the film on morning television, and with the title The Final Frontier, there was this impression that it was the last in the series. Thankfully it wasn't, with a follow-up two years later. When the film came to TV in the early 90s, I did manage to catch it and thought it was okay at best. It certainly wasn't as good as the others in the long-running series. It wasn't until I started getting into films and chatting with fans of Star Trek, it became clear that many considered The Final Frontier the worst in the series featuring the original cast. Its weak story and flimsy visual effects put it down to the bottom of the list, often sharing the same spot with the first film due to its slow pace and with it not really feeling like classic Star Trek. I've returned to part 5 a number of times over the years, and I've never found it unwatchable. It's quite easy to sit through, it's not too long and has some interesting elements, but ultimately it has a compromised script, silly dialogue and the obvious wonky visual effects. There has been endless stories over the years of the conflicts between Nimoy and Shatner, both great friends who argued a lot about the creative directions for Star Trek, and most certainly their egos got the better of them. With Nimoy directing two films in a franchise, Shatner wanted his turn at the wheel, Having the film introduce Captain Kirk climbing a mountain with no climbing gear to demonstrate his great core strength, when Shatner is clearly a bit too old and out of shape to even attempt such a challenge, demonstrates his big ego in full swing. The whole scene is ridiculous, then it's followed by one of the silliest moments in the series, with the Row Row Your Boat song while eating baked beans. It's a shame the scene didn't go full on blazing saddles. What's unfortunate is that the song bookends the film, not the finest way to end a Star Trek movie. Once the stuff on Yosemite is out of the way, 
and we are on the Enterprise, we are introduced to Cyborg and his plans to take over the ship and things fall into place for me. And it turns out to be an enjoyable, though somewhat unspectacular episode of the series. Despite the story's grand ideas, it's very much isolated to the Enterprise, making what could have been an epic adventure feel small in scale. As the voyage home focused more on the humour, part 5 follows suit with less rewarding results, but it still does work in areas. Scotty gets most of the comedic moments which I found hilarious. Some fans do find it all a bit cliche and forced, but honestly it doesn't bother me at all as it's comedy gold seeing Scotty lose his temper and knock himself out. Bill Shatner as well does a great job with the comedy, with his reaction to finding out that Spock has a half-brother, acting baffled and feeling Spock has made it all up. As the idea of finding God changed during the writing process, I think it was clear that discovering the origins of creation would never meet expectations. Having an alien give out false ideals of hope was a neat idea, but the whole concept of this false god being at the centre of the galaxy made it a bit strange that no one else had attempted it before. The Great Barrier was its only method of stopping people getting in, but the Enterprise gets through it easily without much navigation, making the challenge seem an easy feat for Captain Kirk and the crew, so its whole mystery to locate it didn't seem that difficult. The story sadly has been so streamlined and scenes removed, what we are left with is a very thin story that tries to build up to this exciting moment that sadly falls flat on its face. Not in its overall idea, but just on the execution. It's so compromised in its direction and in the editing, it doesn't provide anything particularly exciting. This needed to be an epic confrontation. What I did like is when Bones, Spock and Kirk manage to get away for a short period of time, the alien begins to chase after them, providing some scary sound effects to simulate his anger which are nicely executed and work well if you have a home cinema setup, but it's a small positive in an overall disappointing finale. William Shatner has worked with many great directors over the years, and like many actors who turn to directing, they often pick up their knowledge just due to observing others and gaining the skills on the job, which is just the nature of the business. Shatner had directed some TV and theatre, so he wasn't a total amateur when it came to directing, and with Star Trek V he does a splendid job of getting great performances out of the actors. The best sequence in the film is when Cyborg gets the crew to confront their fears and pain. Bones sees his father on his deathbed and Spock witnesses his own birth, and his father acting in disgust in how human he is. Spock doesn't seem that affected as he has come to terms with his human side. Kirk backs off and doesn't want his pain taken away. He needs his pain because that defines him. Apparently Kirk is supposed to see his son David, but I don't think they ever shot that sequence. The whole scene is certainly up there as one of the most dramatic moments in the series. Lawrence Luckenbill as Cybok is clearly the highlight of the film, giving a very theatrical performance, making all these scenes a joy to watch. Seen as the villain from the start by Starfleet and Captain Kirk, but it becomes clear very quickly his motives aren't to hurt anyone, and his blind ambition and sense of importance dictates his goal to find Shakari at any cost, and realises the error of his ways once confronted with the alien and sacrifices himself to protect the crew. I think the only downside is that we are told of his and Spock's relationship but we never get a lengthy scene with them together to fully explore their differences and have them rekindle their friendship in any meaningful way. We are shown moments of regret from Cybok near the end, but it's just lacking in execution. So when Spock reflects on Cybok at the end on how he lost a brother, it doesn't quite hit the emotional beats to get across to the audience of his loss. William Shatner made the great move of hiring Andrew Laszlo to photograph the film and to help assist him in getting the best shots. Andrew worked on The Warriors, Rambo First Blood and Inner Space. He's a fantastic cameraman. He really makes the film look epic, especially the opening sequence which feels like a scene ripped from Mad Max. Then we see the bar on Nimbus 3 designed and lit with neon lights. This bar somewhat mirrors the cantina bar on Star Wars, though this has the advantage of showing us a Thundercat. The Klingon ship has a very smoky interior, where part 3 relied on a lot of blues and reds for the bird of prey. This has more of an industrial look compared to the clean and slick style of the Enterprise. The Enterprise has a great contrasty look with warm colours and dark blacks, as Laszlo shoots many scenes in shadow and making use of backlighting, just giving the film an extra level of detail and depth. This may be my favourite looking film out of the original six movies. Star Trek V is probably the weakest out of the original bunch. It may be a tad better than the first film. It really depends on what mood you're in. The first film, despite having amazing visual effects for the time, it lacks the energy, pace and moments of interaction between Spock, Kirk and Bones that make Star Trek so special. And Star Trek V, despite its failings, has those classic moments. So it feels more like traditional Star Trek than the first entry in the series. 
The final frontier for sure has its problems, and they are hard to ignore, but the performances, its visual style and score by Jerry Goldsmith make it watchable for me. People often say every other Star Trek film is rubbish, the odd numbered ones for example, but even though they are weaker, that doesn't mean they are awful or unwatchable. They still have their moments and still stand up to repeated viewing. I think most of us who decide to go on a Star Trek binge and watch the first six movies featuring the original cast, we can happily sit through all of them. It's unfortunate William Shatner didn't get to fully realise his vision for this film. What we got was heavily compromised. The heart and passion for the story is there, and the cast give it their all, but the adventure we go on to the final frontier doesn't live up to what it promises. This guy I'm really out there. Maybe he's not out there, Bob. Maybe he's right here. Human heart. <laughs>